Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club. This is episode 46. And as you can see from the lineup of faces with me, this one is special. Um, so we are joined today by a panel of incredible photographers, photo editors, photo directors, uh, to have a really um, straightforward conversation about some of the issues and challenges uh, faced by women in the field of wildlife photography. Um, and we titled it a brave conversation because this isn't something that gets talked about a lot. And also because as always, it is actually incredibly uncomfortable for women to sit around in public and have to talk about dealing with this stuff. Uh, and it genuinely takes a lot of courage to do that. So. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. And I am going to briefly introduce Susie Esterhaus, a renowned and widely published wildlife photographer, founder of Girls Who Click, uh, jury chair of our own annual big picture photo competition, and so much more. Susan T. McElhinney, did I say that right, Susan? Fine. Fine. Okay, that means no. Um, <laughs> photo director for Children's Publication of the <laughs> National Wildlife Federation. Photo editor of Ranger Rick, and among other incredible past experiences, spent seven years at Newsweek as a staff photographer. Uh, Morgan Heim, senior fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers, who also founded Neon Raven Story Lab and co-launched the Her Wild Vision Initiative with our last guest, uh, Jamie Heimbuck. A Jamie, did, did I say that right? Heimbuck. Good enough. <laughs> Man, okay, this is like. Uh -huh actual host asked this stuff beforehand. Uh, Jamie is a National Geographic grantee, founder of Wild Idea Lab, host of um, Impact, the Conservation Photography Podcast, and more, again, more for everyone. But welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it, and I'm really excited for this conversation. And now you can use your voices to say hi. Yay. <laughs> hi. Yay. Thank you. And thank you, Laurel, Thanks, for, Laurel, for getting this set up. I know it took a whole bunch of herding cats. No, no, my my pleasure. Um, and, you know, before we get into the questions, I'll just say, like, viewers, you are welcome to leave comments and ask questions anytime. You can leave them in comments on Facebook and chat box on YouTube. Um, but I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask. And before I do that, I think I'm going to ask all of our panelists to um, introduce themselves and tell us a little more about themselves and potentially their work. And Susie, I'm going to ask you to start. OK, great. So, all right. I'll just probably move this pretty quickly. I just want to tell you guys a little bit about what I do. So I'm a wildlife photographer and I specialize in baby animals. Um, it basically means that I go really in depth on my subjects and like to tell stories of them growing up. Um, my favorite work to do is for magazines. So I do a lot of magazine stories all sort of centered around this same subject. And I work with um, species all over the world. So I've worked at, at one of the highlights in my career I was working at this wild tiger den in India, but also really close to home here um, with sea otters and um, Sumatra with uh, orangutans. One of the things also too that I like to do is work with some animals that are a little bit less known. Uh, penguins are fortunately getting um, a lot of media actually that could be good or bad right now. Um, because they're the most perfect animal on earth. So doing a lot with some of these animals that we don't hear a lot about. Um, the charismatic animals are, are really fun to work with, but so are these sort of more mysterious animals like pangolins, doing a lot in rescue centers with them. This is a baby pangolin nursing, all snuggled up in mom's scales. Um, and then most recently working with a leopardess in Botswana over a two year period photographing her and her cubs um, as they grew up. So my favorite work, as you can tell, is getting really in depth, watching these animals go through dramas in the wild um, and really sort of becoming involved in their lives and being able to document their natural lives, um, ideally without them even noticing me. So my work takes a great amount of patience. I do spend an enormous amount of time in the field to get these photos and often have long days or even periods of weeks where I get absolutely nothing. But in the end, um, it's really rewarding to, to capture some of these really intimate moments that we might not otherwise see. Um, I also do a lot of work uh, with conservation. So I've, I've chosen about 12 conservation groups that I raise awareness and raise funds for. One of my favorites is um, working for sloth conservation with the Sloth Conservation Foundation. Um, but I really do strongly believe in making a difference with the pictures that I take. 
So I, I raise awareness, but also I do raise funds as well. We're, we're reaching around $200,000 for raising money for prints and books and photo tours, which I'm really proud of. And that's something that I continue to be incredibly passionate about. And then the other thing that I'm really passionate about is connecting kids with nature and reaching kids. Um, I think so many conservation programs miss the mark here and are sort of preaching to the choir by really focusing on adults. And, and there's a, definitely a lot of work to be done there, but the, the disconnect with kids in nature and wildlife today is, is really what I see personally as the greatest crisis facing our planet. So I'm working really hard to try to connect young readers through um, magazines and, and children's books that I do. Um, and this leads me very naturally to introduce Susan McElhoney, who is a close friend of mine. She is the photo editor of Ranger Rick, and she's also the vice president of Girls Who Flick, um, which is an organization we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about later. Um, Susan is a longtime advocate of using um, pictures from female nature photographers um, and has really supported female nature photographers for many decades. Um, earlier in her career, she was a staff photographer for Newsweek. She, um, to this day, is the only female staff photographer that ever worked for Newsweek. Um, and then she also did a lot for um, freelance for other publications like People Magazine and many, many others. She then went on to become a photo editor at National Geographic World, and she is now at Ranger Rick, where she has been for 20 years. Um, she really, Susan is a really important figure in the industry for, for women in nature photography. And that's why she gets her own intro delivered. Mm -hmm. Yes, Goodness, this exactly. Is way too much, thank you, Susie. <laughs> um, but Susie is, is, of course, a huge contributor, as are Morgan and Jamie and all the other women who've done wonderful things and are continuing to do wonderful things and really pushing the agenda of reaching children, which it is, as Susie pointed out, critical at this time, that point in time. So I'll go back to you, Laura. Okay, thank you. thank you both so much. I'm gonna um, ask Morgan to introduce yourself. Okay, um, so I'm going to set this to auto advance. Um, hold on one second here. All right. So hi, everybody. I am Morgan Heim, and I am a conservation photographer. I really like to focus very much on um, creating a sense of intimate wildlife experiences that also communicate something to us about how we're relating to wildlife on our planet um, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, through science, through culture, and um, really trying to bring people into kind of the hidden side of a lot of conservation work. So for me, it's not, it's not just about documenting process, but I really want people to be able to relate to the people doing conservation work as human beings. So oftentimes that means spending time with them in all those moments in between the science work and uh, in the time periods where everything maybe seems quiet and you're starting to really see who they are as people. So I, I've had the good fortune of working with a lot of different publications over the years. Uh, my background is in science and I thought for a while that's what I would do, but um, I eventually realized that what I loved was all the stories of science. So that features to some extent um, in most of the projects that I work on. But um, it's really about working with different publications like Ranger Rick, like Biographic, um, which is another outlet that's been really great at hiring women. Um, and I actually just learned that um, the goal in 2021 for Biographic is to have at least half of their stories shot by women, which is a, a really fantastic goal for a publication. Um, and uh, my hope is that by kind of diving into some of these conservation issues, we can start to look at them and relate to them on a level that is more based on kind of universal value sets rather than just telling people um, 
that, oh, there's something really wrong happening over there. Like, I want people to be interested in these stories because of maybe something that's not related to the environment, but that they connect with on kind of a more visceral level, and then they become interested in the environment. So that's one of the things that as I work on different projects that I'm always trying to think about as I approach them, um, when I am observing the world, I, I am trying to think about how is what I'm looking at how is what I'm feeling right now going to get transferred to someone who doesn't get to be here with me? Um, and my hope then is that uh, more people want to get involved, whether it's becoming a photographer and storyteller or just being a little more thoughtful when they are going out into nature. So I thought I would share with you really quickly um, Oh, it's just starting by itself. I didn't realize that. Let me pause this. It is a project that um, Jamie Heimbuck, there we go, that Jamie Heimbuck has actually helped me with. And um, a lot of the pictures that you saw, you know, they're from far off places. And um, I think it's really important to remember that there are amazing conservation stories right here at home. So um, just, just a few weeks ago, Jamie and I spent a week at Wildlife Rehab Center. And I know Susie does a lot of work with rescue animals and rehab centers. And we made a film that ultimately the purpose of this film is to serve as a um, fundraising tool for that organization. Because just like a lot of places, they've been hit really hard by COVID this year. and so they are exploring more unique ways to raise money. So I'm just gonna pay, play you the intro to that film and, um, and maybe someday you'll wanna tune in and watch the rest of it. I'm Melissa Colvin and I'm the bird curator here at the Wildlife Center of the North Coast. Good morning, again. I started working with Cormie, I guess two years ago, training with her and helping her to learn how to participate in her own care a little bit better. So we set out to teach Cormie to take people's money. But that sort of went awry. <laughs> this is what she does in the, uh, it's too hard, I don't understand it. Because like most things, Cormie had her own idea of what she was going to be doing. <laughs> wonderful all right that's great awesome thanks morgan okay and then uh jamie i'd love to hear from you awesome well i am gonna keep uh this very brief because uh, i'm excited about the conversation and i will say that on the cormy video i spent a lot of time doing this with fake money um so I'm also based here on the Oregon coast uh, as well. Um, Morgan and I are actually roommates, which makes it really easy for us to do such local projects together. Um, but I moved up here actually from the Bay Area and the Bay Area is uh, of San Francisco. And that's where I really got started in conservation photography, primarily with an interest in urban coyotes and discovering that this, this urban species um, lives around me and has such an incredible role in the ecosystem. and. Um, that really got me kind of centered in on conservation photography as opposed to wildlife and nature photography because conservation photography really focuses on 
what you do with the imagery to bring awareness to um, people about issues. And so I, I dug in really deep on urban coyotes, um, but then when I moved up to the Oregon coast, I got really excited about the species that are here. And I really got excited about the, the whole ecosystem um, and the way that animals work inside of it. And so that got me interested in, in looking a little bit more deeply at stories that intertwine and show a lot of the complexity of what's going on inside of ecosystems and to help educate people that way. But what I also noticed as I started to get into this is that um, I, I started a local photography tour company and realized how much I absolutely adore uh, teaching and coaching people. And with that came a realization that while I can work on individual stories and individual projects and I can make a difference on certain things at a small scale, if I actually move a lot more into coaching and teaching other people about conservation photography, then I can um, change minds and change hearts on a big, big, big scale because I'm bringing so many more people into the conversation and enabling them um, to get out there and do really amazing things. So that was kind of the um, reason why I've, I work sort of half the time on my own photography work and half the time inside of digital education courses for conservation photography, um, coaching and membership and that sort of thing to try and get as many people as possible involved in conservation photography as what they do. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it at that for now so that we can dive in because we'll learn a lot more about um, some of the projects I'm working on as we talk. Great, okay, thank you all again for that. Um, and thanks to everybody watching. It's great to see your comments. Uh, I think as a first question and maybe just to, to center it a little more, um, you know, I think like as I was thinking about this conversation, like yes, concert, wildlife and conservation photography deliver really amazing images that we love to look at and bring a lot of enjoyment that way. But they are also it is also such a critical tool for every you know scientist and journalist and um, communicator who want who is working to connect the public um, more compellingly, more deeply, more directly to these species and places all over the world. Um, and so talking about it as a profession that's not necessarily welcoming to everyone or even always safe for everyone or whatever, that's actually a really high stakes conversation. And um, so as a first question, I get why, why is the, why is it so male dominated today? How did we get here? And Susie, maybe you could kick us off. Um, okay, so, so this is something that, uh, and I will talk, we'll talk more about Girls Who Click later, but when I launched Girls Who Click, we really looked into why it's male dominated. And, and basically what we found is there's no smoking gun. There's no single reason why. There's, it's a very complex issue. Um, and there's multiple reasons why. What we found is that there's parallels between professional nature photography. And when I say nature photography throughout this whole thing, I mean nature, wildlife, or conservation, those three. Um, but really what we saw is that there's parallels with some of the STEM careers. So, you know, you'll, you'll see women that are majoring in these fields in college and in some of these fields, it's, it's really actually more women than men. But then when you go into the professional arena, the ratio gets totally turned around. Um, and it's very much the same thing with nature photography because we see on an amateur level, the interest is there with women. And in fact, it can be even more women than men these days in terms of on the amateur level. But professionally, it gets really turned around. And there's a lot of reasons I think that that could be. You know, there are legit studies. Some women don't like to hear this, but there are legit studies that have been done that show that women are significantly less competitive than men. And this is an incredibly competitive field. And that can be a real turnoff, I think. And it can be quite intimidating. Um, and then there's other issues too. Some of them are no brainers, like, you know, having children is obviously, you know, there's some misconceptions that the only way to make a living in this career is to travel all over the world 10 months of the year, which is something I've done, but that's because I've chosen not to have children. And there are many other ways of making a living in this career where you don't have to travel globally and you can specialize regionally or even locally and photographers, some have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And then there's also, you know, some some other issues like um, the marketing is mostly pitched towards men. Um, so when you see these big new lenses come out, these, uh, even some of the camera bodies, you'll see men are always the ones holding them. And this marketing 
material. Um, and I think that affects us on a very subconscious level. And then there's also the fact that, you know, there, because there's few women in it, there's just very few role models to look up to. I mean, Susan and I were having a conversation the other day that when I was getting started in this career, all my role models were women that worked in tandem with a man. And there were very few independent. When I was going into the career, there were none um, that I knew of. And so I think that meant that, you know, the last thing we really looked at was physical safety which I know we're gonna talk about, but there are some physical safety issues that women have to face that men may, may face less of that we have to think about. And then also we're raised you know, with this idea. I know I was very much raised, it's ironic because what I do now in my life, but I was raised with like, I wasn't allowed to do a lot of things that my brother could do alone because I was a girl. And some of it rightfully so to keep me safe as a child, but there's that too that we grew up with. So there's just many, many layers of it. Um, and it is complex. And again, there's no single smoking gun. Well, Susie, everything that you say is, is spot on. Um, I, I'll say that with regards to the advertising and the merchandising of the equipment, they can, to this day, they can still be so blatant as to have an ad for a, a photo class at a local camera store and they'll have pictures of Hulu girls. You know, and yeah. it's like, hello, you know, who are you marketing this to? I was a Leica ad, you know, Leica should know better. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really sort of surprising. Yeah. It's um, and it's just a lack of thinking through a lot of these these prejudices that are deeply set. Of course, one of the things I'm not sure that you mentioned it was the the equipment itself is not necessarily the backpacks and and the belt packs and things like that were not initially built for women. I know that in my early days, it was very difficult for me to find um, appropriate gear that I could comfortable, comfortably carry. And um, it wasn't even designed by photographers, much less women photographers. Uh, it was crazy. And of course, women's clothes, clothing was always inappropriate for the job too. So what we were expected to wear as ladies versus, you know, what was practical and and uh, uh, field um, it was good to wear in the field it was not necessarily there for women but, so yeah uh, yeah it, but. I think too um I'd like to add in in addition to the gear thing which is like I'm five two and so that's definitely an issue for finding the right pack mm -hmm. and being able yeah. to carry stuff but I, I want to kind of return back also to the idea of how um women are kind of positioned in this field as well I just picked up a magazine like last week and was looking through it and there was a back-to-back -back article one was about a female nature photographer and one was about a male nature photographer and the language that was used in those articles were radically different and one was about how she was a wildlife photographer who um, mostly made her living as do, uh, doing wedding photography and she did the nature stuff on the side and then finally she was able to figure out how through leading tours she could do this full time and fulfill her dream. And then the male photographer, it was, he dug deep into all of the research about how to market yourself and position yourself and advertise and, and learned algorithms and, and it was like way more technical and business oriented. And then the like, so the language that was used just in describing two people doing identical jobs was really different. And I think that that is an issue. And there's a whole other conversation in terms of the, the type of photography, the types of images that are kind of celebrated and rewarded um, inside of wildlife photography that tends to have a much more masculine vibe and i think that a lot of times more feminine vibes um softer imagery things that are more like cultural and kind of narrative or those are not rewarded they're kind of like pushed to the side as like not real and that's something that i've personally and we can get into this later but i've personally really battled with myself and my sense of style and embracing my style because i kept thinking no 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 if i want to be a real conservation photographer i needed to be more more edgy, more masculine, more dark, more conflict oriented, more this and that. That's, I, I, I had to let that go and that was hard work. And I think that a lot of us feel like, oh, well, we can't do that because we're not, we're not that type of photographer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, God, Jamie, there's been like, I can't tell you how many times we've had this conversation before where 
Um, and James actually one of the people who had this conversation too, which is just that idea of um, almost like wanting to have a, like being like, can can I be my kind of photographer? Like there's, I've had several photographers that were like, I've been trying really hard to shoot a very particular way and that's not me. And it was like, they were looking for permission to be themselves as photographers. And I think that we need to find ways to, and it's, and that's, I think, regardless of gender, but I think it's really prevalent amongst women to be like, find your vision as a photographer and, and go out there and know that it's okay to approach photography that way. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing that says you have to pro approach it this one particular way. And the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, there's some outlets that have been really, really good with hiring women like Ranger Rig, like Audubon um, and Biographic. And then there's others that are just, they're, they're trying to get kind of starting to try to get with the program, I think. But um, I think that it requires an enormous amount of effort and, and it's very easy for people to fall back into old habits and they fall into these things of like, um, they just forget to look. For, for new photographers or for more diversified talent. And so I think that that is something that is gonna just really take a lot of effort to consciously work at until it becomes more of a muscle memory so that you know it doesn't have to be too far one way or the other. Well, Morgan, I think, it, I think it's um, a big factor here is that the people who are using photography, who are buying photography, and are putting it in the marketplace in the form of magazines and things like that are looking at their audiences and they are assessing what their audience is comfortable with and they are afraid to break out of those boxes and do something different i mean i know that there are men, male photographers who have a unique vision which is not accepted um, for the same reasons um, that nobody's willing to photography but it's more prevalent with women because women have bring something else to the table. So, yeah. Oh, Laurel, we can't hear you. Thank you so much. Um, on the um, topic of just representation, I was going to call out one of our YouTube um, viewers who said that they were looking on um, on Splash and Pexels for images of women documentary makers. And they got lots and lots and lots of photos of really muscular ripped men and only one woman in that entire batch. So, and also on that topic, since we're talking about something that is um, a field that's so critical to have a diversity of people and perspectives in, we should acknowledge that we are talking about this as a group of white women. And that also is problematic and not representative of the world as it is and um, this field as it needs to be. So, um, okay. so. To keep us moving forward, I was going to dive in, ask everybody to dive in a little deeper and talk more specifically about some of the challenges that you have faced in the field um, as women and, and whether that's extended to things as overt as sexism and sexual harassment. And um, maybe Morgan, you can kick us off on this one. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, as you can imagine, this is probably a, a question that's particularly hard to talk about, but. You know, I, I feel very lucky that in my career, in terms of, you know, where sexual harassment is concerned, I personally haven't been um, subject to it, at least not to my face. Um, and I, I've, I've felt fairly respected in that front. But there have definitely been times where I, you know, you can't prove it, but you have these very strong feelings that there were choices made and things you didn't get to do. And it was because of being a woman. Um, you know, there was one time where I thought I had a very um, exciting job opportunity. Um, it was, they were talking about the next time they're calling me, it's to get my vaccines for travel and get the travel arranged. And so I thought it was like definitely happening. And then um, a few days went by and I, they contacted me back and informed me that they'd get, given the job to a man. And it involved a, you know, a long stint in a jungle. And, um, and I can only think that there was somebody on the, uh, sitting around the table that they just felt more comfortable sending a man to do that job than to send me, even though I had as much or more experience at the time. Um, 
And I've had friends that, you know, they've, I've had a friend who um, she was, in, she was told after giving a presentation that if she wanted to have a career in this field, what she ought to do is marry a rich man who does it. Um, I have another friend who was basically told, um, well, let's talk about a job opportunity after you kind of have done this mother thing for a little while and are sure you still want to do it. Um, I had another friend that was told by a photographer that um, a woman would never be hired as, as his assistant. And so it's very real, things like that happen. I've, had, I've also had jobs where um, just trying to do my job in the field, the people that I'm working with, some of the subjects, they, they don't want me to try to do things because they're worried as a woman that I'm not gonna you know, be able to physically handle the situation, you know, sometimes climbing on things or riding around on certain equipment and stuff like that. And we have to just sort of like, usually the way that I, I deal with it is I'm like, oh, I got this, you know, and, and, and just stay really lighthearted and continue to, you know, I just climb on stuff anyway. And then eventually they're like, oh yeah, she's just climbing that thing again. They don't, they get, they get over it. But like, it, these are things where I feel like um, we have to navigate that an awful lot in this field. And I know that there are probably instances where, I know that there are instances where other women um, do feel sexually harassed and, and it is something that we have to be very mindful of. There's a lot of, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's just, it's not something that is unfortunately that we can just ignore. Well, sometimes um, it's interesting, Morgan, the, um, historically, I think we used to be safer in, in the field or on the street than we are now. I think our world is less safe now um, for, and all the more reason for us to be more vigilant. A lot of the reason that things were safer and sometimes still is today is because of paternalism. I mean, they're just being, oh, she's a nice little girl. Let's need to protect her and I don't want to put her in harm's way which is not giving her the opportunities needless to say but it's just putting things in some context there so I just wanted to chime in that um, first of all Morgan thank you for sharing that um, and I wanted to also echo what Morgan said that, like and you, Laurel, like this is really tough stuff to talk about. And I think one of the reasons why it's hard to talk about, particularly in this industry, at least this is how I felt, is that I didn't talk about it because I felt then I would be a whiner and I'd be like wimpy and people would see me as like not tough enough and complaining. And so I went through the first 15 years of my career really not talking about it except with like my closest girlfriends. And, um, and then I realized, I think when I hit my 40s, that when, especially when I started Girls Who Click, I thought, well, we're really doing young women entering this career a, a huge disservice by not talking about it. Because I had absolutely no clue when I went into this career that I'd be facing what I faced. And I did, unfortunately, face a lot of it direct. Like, I, I'll give you some specific examples that, you know, it's funny, before we were going to do this show, I made a list and I actually had to narrow down the experiences that I would actually talk about because they're just too freaking many. And that is really sad. But like, you know, here's a great example is um, at one of my first conferences for photography, um, I was there with some of my colleagues and we had the same stock agent and they didn't know who I was. And um, about three of them thought that I was at, at individual moments, assumed I was a photo editor and not a photographer because I was a young woman. They're like, so what, what magazine do you edit? And I'm like, no, actually I'm, I'm one of Minden's photographers. Like we're at a Minden dinner, like I'm one of you guys, you know? And then there were also, um, I remember being at a similar situation, same conference a few years later where like, I'm waiting in line for coffee behind one of the sort of old boys in the industry whom I won't name, but like one of the top names. Um, and I walk behind to get uh, coffee and he turns to me and literally says, Susie, the little girl's line is over there. And then he and all of his friends started laughing. Um, I've been on all male expedition staff where literally 
I got bullied and hazed so much that it got so brazen that on the radio in front of clients paying guests who overheard the conversation, one of the guys said to another leader, let's get Susie out in her bikini so that we can see her ass. And they actually had female clients from the tour complain to the owner of the company because they overheard it. And you know, the entire time I wasn't saying anything about it, I was just trying to do my job. And maybe to the guys I would be like, F you, and I stood up for myself. But I wasn't beyond that, like making any waves and trying to really create change because I was just trying to like bury my head in the sand and um, and and make it and do what I wanted to do. And so those are like the over it. And then there's the little ones that I think all of us experience, and that's like the patronization in the field, right? So like how many times are you in the field and you're all set up and some guy comes over to show you something about your camera, having no idea that you're a professional or let me show you how to do this or comments like, you know, I swear to God more than once I've heard that's a really big lens for such a little girl. A guy literally came up to me in the field once and said, wow, your hands are so tiny. What do you actually do with them? I'm like what? Like it's just, and so it goes beyond, there's like the overt, there's the, and then these little comments. And so the patronization, I think, is one of the things that's constantly reinforcing this in this job, the mansplaining, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, anyway, th those are those are my two cents on it. And, um, and I think these are all, as I said before, these are all things that we need to talk about so that we can create change and um, and maybe make some guys realize, because I think some guys don't even know when they're being patronizing. I don't think men necessarily are fully aware of it when they're mansplaining. Yeah. 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 I mean, and that's One, traditionally true. I mean, that's been around for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And one other area that we haven't touched on quite yet is the fact that there is a pay issue. Um, there is very, very much an equal pay issue. So even this is like even more kind of covert than some of the comments or things that men don't realize what it's doing to you when they say it like, oh, that's such a big lens or how do you carry all of that? Or you're, you're way too tiny to carry all that. Like that is demoralizing in a lot of ways. But then sometimes things happen where you don't even realize that they're happening, which is you're getting paid less than your male counterparts. And one instance where I experienced this was one of my dear friends who's a man, we're sitting next to each other at a conference and we had submitted images to a publication for an article and the editor sent back what she was gonna offer us for our individual images and we were comparing the emails and I was getting paid less for the same sized images in the same article by that publication than the man who was sitting right there next to me. Oh, so oh, there's all, and but I wouldn't have known that had we not been sitting next to each other. Um, and then luckily he's amazing. So we strategized how we were gonna make sure that, you know, we, we got equal pay, but um, you would never know that. And so I think that there's ways that women are being discriminated against that we don't even realize because we don't have that obvious data next to us. Yeah, hundred percent. And then also what, what Mo had said too, about how many jobs you don't get and you have no idea and you suspect it's because you're a woman, but you, you can't prove it. You don't know for sure. There's so much of that that happens. Yeah. It's just under the radar. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the other things that's really hard that comes out of that is like, I don't, I don't want to go through life suspicious <laughs> that of, of, why things are happening. Um, I don't want to be someone, I don't want to be bitter or anything like that. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like, um, you know, all of us have been quite good at, at, you know, kind of acknowledging that these things exist, but, but not letting it sour our experiences in the field. And, and, and there's a lot of good stuff that happens in the field too, but it is a difficult thing to, to, I, and I think this goes to Susie's point about not wanting to be a whiner because um, I, I love this field. I love so many of the people that are in my community that I get to work with. And, um, and but I do think it's important to acknowledge that there's all these kind of things in the undercurrent and sometimes overtly just out there that women are kind of habitually dealing with. And, um, and so, yeah, it's definitely kind of a tough line to walk to to feel like you want to talk about that and just not then be labeled as like, you know, 
someone who's mad at the world or something, or is always going to be suspicious of ulterior motives if something yeah. doesn't go your way, you know. Yeah. This is really just stating the facts. So it's out there. And maybe by stating these facts, we will open some minds and broaden awareness you know, among some people. Yeah. yeah. I feel really lucky because I think that, um, you know, at least everyone who on this call, we are of a personality type in the first place that tends to stay solutions oriented. And when we see a problem, we're like, all right, well, what are we going to do about it? And and all of us in our own ways have done that. Um, not everyone has that built into themselves. And I think that that's why it's so incredibly important for those of us who do like to be solutions oriented to act, to speak, to do something so that we can help bolster the other people who don't feel like they yeah. can, or that's not part of the mindset. We need to kind of protect everyone a little bit. Yeah, yeah, probably. And, and before we start kind of talking more, some of our later questions are more about solutions and to what extent things are changing and who plays a role in changing them. But before we do that, I wanted to dig a little further into just the actual um, experience of being out in the field and shooting and ask whether personal safety becomes an issue at that point, and if so, kind of what um, tactics you have for keeping yourself safe while, while on jobs. Um. And, yeah, Susie, yeah I, I was going to ask Susie to kick us off just because um, we had talked about it a bit before, but I'd really love to hear from everyone. Yeah, so so personal safety is something that I feel quite passionate about. Um, I had unfortunate situations in the field that um, were quite scary. I think these are probably the hardest things to talk about, right? Like this is like worse than the previous question, um, but I had you know, when I, early in my career, I had a situation where I was on the street. I was not alone. I was with someone else. And I was um, literally plucked off the street and thrown into a car and was, you know, someone was trying to kidnap me and I um, fought my way out of it. And that came very naturally to me, I think. Um, I think, you know, people say you're born with this freeze, flight, fight thing. And I think I've always I actually, I don't know if I was always a fighter, but I was bullied as a kid and my dad taught me how to fight. And so when that happened, it was like instinct and I fought my way out of it and I got out of it, um, you know, a bit hurt, but, you know, relatively not badly safe. Um, I also had a situation uh, many years later in um, East Africa when I was living in a bush camp and I had um, some drunk rangers show up um, and try to uh, arrest me for, for poaching, which um, obviously I wasn't doing. Um, and there were about 12 of them and they were armed. And it was all basically because I had turned down the sergeant. The sergeant had hit on me earlier in the day. I was there alone, operating alone. And um, and it was really, really terrifying. And I, again, got out of it unscathed. So I've been incredibly lucky that um, those two situations and the others that are more minor um, and, and I don't know, you know, I, my mom likes to say I have a guardian angel, but one of the things when I started Girls Who Click, and I know we'll talk about that later, but we work with young, really young women, teens. And so the personal safety issue was really important to me because I think that we can't go into this career with this pie in the sky vision of, you know, the world is a really safe place for a woman, particularly a woman operating alone, because that's really not the case. And sometimes when, you know, I was born in suburbia and I was not born with a lot of street smarts, um, I didn't really need them. And so going into some of these situations, I was um, making choices that I may not make today. And it's very easy to do, especially when you're really driven and you want to succeed and you're very passionate and, and you feel brave. Um, so you do things that aren't necessarily wise. And, you know, there's so many ways that I think that we can keep ourselves safe. And um, I know we're gonna have a conversation about that. I think one of the things that I do, and this is an unfortunate thing that has to happen is I, um, I'm i different in the field than I am at home. I, I remember one of my boyfriends once when he saw me in the field, he was like, oh my God, you're like a different person. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you're like badass, you're a macho, He's like you even walk different. And and I mean, I dress differently, I'm very modest and I don't, 
I don't, you know, want to wear anything that's revealing. I don't want to attract attention to myself. And I'm not very friendly. I'm not, you know, unfriendly, but I'm definitely not friendly, particularly to men. There are certain things that I don't do. And I'm not just talking in, in other cultures. I'm talking when I work in the United States, too, because we have this misconception that, like, bad things are only going to happen to girls working alone in foreign countries, which is a bunch of BS. And so I, you know, I just bury myself in this way as much as I can of, like, do not mess with me. Like, I can take care of myself. And my whole demeanor changes. And then also, like, it's really unfortunate. And it goes back to, like, what Mo had said in the previous question about like not wanting to you know become paranoid about sexism and stuff like that in this field I I I have to say like after those incidences I'm pretty paranoid when it comes to personal safety and now I notice if there's a vehicle behind me or if there's a man walking behind me even at home in Petaluma California I am very aware of what's going on around me and that's the saddest part is that we have to become paranoid of things like that um and yeah, so, and I know there's loads of other texts that we'll all talk about in terms of being safe, but I think it is really important to to really talk about these issues, particularly for young women, um, because I, I have this terrible, my worst fear with girls who think is that one of our girls will get into trouble somehow into the, in the field by herself. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in? things you do well i have to um yeah i'll, I'll chime in oh go ahead Mo, go <laughs> um i kind of will just echo what Susie does well where i, was just, I think oh, that, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> i think i'm on a delay because i can hear you talking upstairs but it's not happening here so <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Jamie. Okay, um, I I do agree with Susie that when like when it comes to being in the field, I am way less like I'm not a nice person in the field when I'm by myself. Um, even if men like come up to say something or ask a question, I often will just ignore them um, and continue on with whatever it is that I'm doing because I don't want to even engage and risk what could potentially happen from there. And I do also just in terms of personal safety. I carry bear spray and I carry an um, a, an alarm whistle where when you pull it apart, it does this really shrill, crazy alarm. And I have that for humans, not for wildlife when yeah. I'm out in the field. Well, apropos of what Jamie was saying, Susie and I were having this conversation and I asked her what she uses. And I said, well, do you carry pepper spray when you're in the field? She said, well, it's illegal to carry pepper spray in many parts of the world. You can, it's it's a felony. Therefore, when she was in Africa for three years, she carried a machete. <laughs> now imagine that. <laughs> Fantastic. Not that I could actually use a machete. I don't think I could actually turn a machete on anyone if I tried, but it made me feel a little bit safer. But the, I love, Jamie, what you said about like, we carry, you know, bear spray and stuff, not, not for animals, right? We do it for, for men, right? For the for the other predators out there. And then someone was recently telling me, this is a really good one and I haven't looked into this, but someone was recently telling me about this spot device that you can get, which basically is like a, a device that you carry that is connected to satellite and you can send an SOS and it works in like 93 countries or something in the world. And so that sounds pretty fantastic as well to have something like that on you. Yeah. And of course, like the basics, right, of always like letting someone know where you are, um, you know, is is super important as well. Yeah. Morgan, I know you were going to add something. I was just going to say quickly that this is a really, this is the same kind of thing that I hear from our um, our female curators at the academy. So our women scientists who go out in the field and they do expeditions and field work and are often on their own or with teams they're not familiar with. And so, yeah. Morgan, what were you going to add? Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to add, so I'm actually trained in mixed martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's actually how I met my husband. Um, but, <laughs> but, 
but and, and I not that I'm like a great uh, uh, boxer or anything like that, but I do think, and not that everyone has to do that, but I do think that like, I mean, I did it because I thought it would be fun and I wanted to like know what it felt like to punch something and how how hard of a punch I could throw, that kind of thing. And uh, but the thing is, is I do think having a little bit of some uh, a class mm -hmm. in something like that, there's just something that it makes you feel a little bit like you've got some more resources, um, regardless of what you're carrying on, on you as a person. Because if you can know kind of those body movements, know how to throw a punch, know how to get out of a grip, things like that, like having some sort of basic self-defense class is, I think, always good. Um, I also think, you know, this makes the job sound scary. It, it, most of the time I'm not walking around being like, oh my God, something terrible is gonna happen or could happen. But, um, you know, knowing how to behave around police officers, re regardless of where you are. I've, I've, had, I've had the cops called on me multiple times. Um, and wow. I've had many times where, and I wasn't doing anything, you know, wrong or illegal. It's like, uh, but people, I think especially now, are really hyper vigilant on that front. And so, if they see anything that's they think is weird, they they'll the first reaction is to call the cops. And um, but I've I've had to talk with cops, you know, that have approached me in the dark without lights and without identifying themselves. And I've had to ask them if they're a cop, and then they say, you know, they say yes, we are. And and I have a whole like, I just try to be very, um, like, you know, some of the project, one of the projects was having to do with photographing roadkill. And so, you know, I'm making these floral arrangements around dead animals on the side of the road. And I've got, you know, my, all my safety gear set up and everything. It's clear I'm not trying to hide. And, you know, for me, like the, the approach in a lot of those situations is to acknowledge the weirdness of it and be like, I know this looks this is, I, <laughs> I'm taking pictures of, of dead animals. It's part of a, an art project. And, um, you know, I have to say things like, can I, can I reach, you know, to get for my wallet to show you my driver's license and things like that. So having, having thought out potential scenarios, you can't account for everything, but I think it is good to do like game theory in your head and, and, um, take some classes in self-defense, um, talk with experts uh, about how to potentially react in different situations so that if you do face any of them, you feel like you've got some things in your toolkit that you can draw from. It'll just, I think, help you handle these situations um, to the best of your ability. Um, yeah. You know what? And I love what you said about you know, acknowledging that you're doing something weird. Um, and because it's true, like being aware of your behavior and your surroundings, I think is something that always helps to keep me safe of like, okay, what am I doing? And is it socially accept acceptable? Is it culturally acceptable? And um, if it's not, what can I do to make it acceptable? And I mean, I've even in some places have hired men to be project managers to go into meetings for me when it wasn't acceptable for a woman to go into those meetings. Like, so there's, there's certain ways too. I think of, um, you know, uh, should I be out at night? Like, you know, is this a place that I, I should be right now? Or should I bring somebody with me? There's also like one of the things that I love about some of the younger photographers that I'm seeing is a lot of collaboration in projects and people working in teams. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful thing creatively, but I also think it's a nice thing to have people to be in the field with. And that idea of like, you don't have to do everything alone. When I was younger, I thought I had to do absolutely everything alone. And a lot of that was like lack of resources and not knowing someone that wanted to do it with me or not having money um, to hire a local guide or whatever it is. But like that, this idea of like, we, actually we can be in the field as a team and not every project needs to be me flying solo can help keep you safe as well, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much for that. That's great. Um, to pivot a little bit, uh, since we've been talking about some tough stuff, 
Um, I wanted to ask whether you think there are any advantages to being a woman in this field. And maybe I'll kick this one to Jamie to start us off. Sure. Um, I, I really do think that there's advantages to being a woman in the field. And we spent a lot of time talking about the disadvantages, but there's probably equally as many advantages. Um, and I'll start with one that makes me sound a little bit cynical, but it's true. Um, in that because you're underestimated so much um, and because you get mansplained to so much, you can get so much information out of people who um, don't realize that you're basically taking notes to go be able to do stuff. So like there was a guy um, who was photographing a peregrine nest and I just basically walked up with a camera and all of a sudden he went into this like 45 minute diatribe about everything about these birds as if he was informing me like a member of the public. And so I'm like, oh, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I've, I've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. And got so much information to go be able to, to photograph these birds that I would not have had otherwise if this guy didn't assume that I was stupid. So I think that there's a lot of um, ability to kind of use the being underestimated to your advantage. But to be on a more positive note, I think that some advantages to being a woman in this field is that um, well, two things, both animals can feel safer with you and people can feel safer with you. Uh, and therefore there's something, and I don't know, I don't know if there's scientific data to back this up, but one of the things that I've noticed is um, if you're shooting out with men, sometimes animals will have a more abrupt reaction to men. Whereas with a woman, they're just kind of a little bit more relaxed. I don't know if it has to do with mannerisms. I don't know if it has to do with size or vibe. I don't know. But I, I have noticed that. So I feel like there's potentially, and Susie, you'd be able to speak a lot more eloquently about this than me. But so there's maybe that. But when it comes to people, I think that it can be a lot easier to get human subjects to feel a lot more comfortable with you um, in order to have more like candid portraiture moments to get to know them better as subjects, to get to know sides of their story that might not come out. Um, if, if it were a male who is documenting them. Um, so I think that there's something about the, either the assumption or the, the concept that we are a little bit like more nurturing, more safe, more community oriented, that can bring out elements of a story that might not otherwise come out or bring out elements of people as you're photographing them that might not otherwise come out. Jamie, yeah. if I can add there, these are all the reasons why a lot, a lot of editors will actually hire women to do these jobs because they can get into a situation. They know how to handle themselves better. A lot of people are put off by photography, particularly these days, everything's sort of invasive. Uh, but a woman with a camera is a lot less invasive and can do things and um, more in a more subtle and uh, more sensitive manner. So, but all the reasons that you state. Yeah. I, and I totally agree with you, Jamie. Like, I think for the majority of my career, it's not an advantage, but there have been some occasions where it really truly is a massive advantage. I work a lot in other cultures and sometimes hanging out with women. I love hanging out with women and children in other cultures just because I feel really safe with them. And sometimes that'll really get you closer to the communities that you need to make inroads and in to get access to wildlife. And I've used that in East Africa um, to my advantage at times. The other thing that I did that is probably something that some women would find fault with, and I probably shouldn't even be saying it, but I'm gonna say it. I, I had a massive advantage when I was photographing pygmy sloths in Panama. Um, we snuck in as tourists, it's not probably not cool to talk about, but we basically got denied a journalist permit. So we just went in illegally as tourists and um, we actually, me and the sloth researcher who happens to be blonde and beautiful and her assistant who happens to be blonde and voluptuous and just a total sex spot, we put her uh, in a bikini on the front of the boat and, um, and I drove with the tourists and of the sloth researcher and we told around and I tell you, nobody thought twice about us because we were just like three young girls looking completely touristy and totally harmless. I think if we had been three men in that position, somebody probably would have gotten suspicious of like, why are these girls coming every single day? What are they doing? And instead we just had guys, you know, occasionally show up and flirt with us and that was about it. And so that's when I was like thanking my lucky stars that I was born a woman because I don't think I would have been able to pull that off. Um, 
And I, you know, certainly don't think if we had had like a, a blonde guy and put him up on the front of the boat, I don't think he would have been nearly as effective as Sarah. So um, there definitely are times when it is an advantage. <laughs> Susan, did you? Oh, Susie, ahead, I'm glad to hear you did something like that because I, I, I did something like that too on one of my first projects. My friend and I went to Thailand and we were just on a tourist visa and we just like really tried to play the stereotype that of like two young 20 something girls with too much luggage, you know, and we just are kind of, you know, happy go lucky just here for fun <laughs> travelers. And it really just, it was so helpful knowing that like people are just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> like, That's so funny. Right. I guess it, you're making the that the assumption that you're not doing anything particularly interesting. It like re really worked for you there. And Susan, did you tell me, I think you told me that you used to get more time in portraiture sessions. Oh, yeah. Women? yeah, I, I, you know, I'd be regularly sent to Capitol Hill to or anywhere to do portraits of people. And, you know, a, sen a male senator will give a young woman a lot more time to chat with her and, it's a lot of opportunities that way. I mean, it's we're using our sex to our advantage, and you know, okay, men do the same thing, I guess. Um, but uh, those are the ways we can do it. Yeah, whether it's getting in, I used to sweet talk the Secret Service all the time. You know, <laughs> about my way frequently. So you're gonna make you a T-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to stick. I, not, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Something else. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that sometimes too, there's a, there's a, there's still a novelty attached to women being in these situations sometimes that I think can really um, set a nice tone for a lot of these shoots where even your subjects are like, oh, this is kind of not what I was expecting and actually kind of a little, you know, more fun because it's, it's, it's still something new and different. And th there's like an unexpected element to like what, what's going to happen with, with how, how we're all going to operate in the field. And it can set sometimes a really, really just like nice vibe um, amongst the people that you're, you're covering or working with. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Susan, I was going to go back to you to ask um, whether you think that editors play a role in the problem broadly and to what extent they can be part of a solution. Well, I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, and yes, I mean, I think that we go into uh, assignments, uh, editing with preconceptions. And what we need to do is push those preconceptions aside. And it's male editors it's female editors um and we need to be be willing to take a chance sometimes or willing to um really work with an individual who may not have the same kind of experience um editors are part of the problem there's no question um many of us um i mean it's it's the same situation with a young photographer who's never been published it's a catch-22. They can't get published until they've been published. And women are having the same problems of getting in the door and then getting the assignments. And uh, it takes, you know, some brave editors. It takes um, some thinking outside of the box. And uh, But I think that uh, it's not just women. I think... <clears throat> I think... Um, um, I think that diversity that we need is all the way across runs the gamut. You know, I'm doing a story this next month about animals that take their own pictures. I'm interested to see how they take their pictures, what their point of view is. So not just joking, sort of, but, you know, <laughs> angle and taking its own pictures it should be interesting. So <laughs> it's a different perspective, different way of seeing things. Women have, uh, um, just very different ways of saying things like all the rest of us do, so. Great. Morgan, I think you were talking, when you were talking earlier about the assignment that you, that you thought you had and kind of lost that would have involved staying in a jungle, it sounded like one of the people that would have made that decision was a woman. And it's, so I, 
if I heard that right. And I think it's interesting to think that even even like good intentions, like I want to keep this person safe or I, you know, this might not, maybe I can find them a later job could often be really undermining women's chance to just get out there and do the work. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I, I actually, in that instance, I think it, I had a, a woman editor who was advocating for me, but it was other, so I think with some of these assignments, you know, you could have, this is where like the editors don't always have as much power as you think they're gonna have. Sometimes with some assignments, there's a table full of, yeah. you know, um, higher ups within the organization that are deciding who's going to go where and they could come in at the last minute and be like, actually, I don't think that this is, a, mm -hmm. you know, I want so and so to go on this or I, I don't think it's a good situation for a woman to go into. So um, I think that's actually more of what happened in that situation, because I think I actually had the main editor and the main photographer advocating for me. But there were other people in the room that didn't see the same way that they did. And um, so, and I think that's just an important thing for all of us to remember as we work with publications and organizations is that there could be people we have no idea who are at the table that are bringing their biases to the situation. Um, but, but I do, there are definitely, there, I mean, there's, there's always times where there could be someone who, whether for making a, either making an assumption or wanting to be protective, they maybe do things that they think is like in the best interest of someone and, and it actually is holding them back or, you know, and it's more about maybe some, um, I think it's also maybe reflecting insecurities that that person themselves may have, you know? So it's, I think, just a process of, of learning how to pay attention to that and, and try to take steps to not let that sway your decisions. I think there's an interesting I wanna, parallel. Go ahead, Jamie. No, no, no. I, I was just gonna say there's a very interesting parallel to uh, conflict photography because the, the conflict photography publications have been called out a lot for using men versus women and things have changed for the better over the last several years. Um, and I think there's, if you look at wildlife photography without calling out certain publications in particular, but if you look at some of the, the top publications and look at their history of, of who is getting the assignments, um, it is, you know, there's a few top ones that are really, have done a great disservice to the women in this community um, and by, by routinely hiring men. And that is, in my opinion, a, a massive part of the problem. It's also one of the reasons why I chose to um, not do a lot of assignment work in my career and just, you know, mostly do everything. Almost all the magazines and stories I do is on spec. Um, and so that I don't have to be at the mercy of, of those kind of decisions. I think that is an important mindset to take. Um, like, basically not allowing someone else to be the gatekeeper of you getting to do what you want to do. So, um, you know, still finding ways to get, engage with the thing that you want to do and being like, well, I'm going to figure out how to do it anyway. And then you guys can catch up with me. And um, I, I think it's such a, and then, then you do, you know, you will find opportunities in, in various outlets, whether it's a publication or, other organizations are putting together exhibits like there's so many avenues into having a successful career in doing this and i really like setting like this mindset of like well i'm just gonna still do it and i'll figure it out and then you know maybe you'll be so lucky to like catch up with me you know just like being a little playful with it and and just not letting anyone tell you that you can't do something yeah I think too that there's, um, and this is by no means providing an excuse or anything because it is still on editors to make the effort. Um, and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys are pretty darn time strapped. So when it comes to trying to find someone for an assignment or to be able to do something, sometimes the idea of needing to really dig into finding 
people finding women in this field to be able to go hire and to vet them and to make sure that their work is you know a match for the magazine it's i feel like so many editors are like well we already know so and so he's shot for us before we know he can do it let's just go ahead and use that and so the same people tend to get picked for assignments which tend to be men i mean that's one of the reasons why morgan and i built her wild vision initiative was because editors are busy people how can we remove barriers how can we remove excuses so that they can really rapidly find women who can fit the bill for the assignment and then take a chance on them instead so even though there's yeah oh, editors are part of the problem because of mindsets or you know there's higher ups and everything there's also just some simple aspects to the job which is you don't have a lot of time you're incredibly busy people and so how do we make sure that editors have the resources so that they don't have the excuse of using the same guys over and over again or not taking a chance on a woman right no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are many of those issues. It, we, yeah, we have limited time resources. We have limited resources for doing a lot of that research to find the people who can do these different things. And uh, yeah, totally. I mean, those are all factors. We need to know who's out there in order to hire them too. Yeah. So I want to, I want to spend the last, our, you know, our, our last question is just getting everyone to talk about resources that they're involved in or admire or know of. Um, and so I want to save time for that. I, before we dive into that, though, um, I want to cover because we've, you know, we've talked about disadvantages, we've talked about advantages, but in terms of what women actually bring to the work um, from an artistic perspective that men may not, I'd love to have you speak to that um, before. You know, I don't want to miss that piece of it. Um, and anyone can lead that one. Or I can pick. Um, well, I, I think that there are things that women just will pay, that will pay attention to that's just different. I think it happens anytime you have kind of a different group of people that approach a story, they're going to approach it with all of their life experience, and which might be different from someone else's, and they're gonna approach it from maybe a different aesthetic. Um, you know, not to be stereotypical, because one of the things that drives me nuts about a lot of like competitions or granting opportunities for women is that it assumes we want to cover women's issues, or it assumes that we want to be documenting only a like a category, a certain category of subject matter. Um, but I still think that there are things, whether it's that these things that I think have been associated a lot with women, like that nurturing or that sense of community will pay attention. There's so many times where, you know, I, the, I see women, they go and they pay attention to like the family activity, whereas the guy is like over, he's mess, he's playing with, you know, playing with the drone and, and with technology or looking at process. And so we just might go into these stories through a different gateway and it can give us a different level of intimacy or it might let us approach something from a perspective that is like a value set that maybe is different than than what's traditionally been shown in the past. So I think that, um, and then there's our artistic elements too. There's some, there's uses of light and shallow depth of field and framing that I think can just be very unique. You can tell when it's sort of like got this feminine sort of touch to it. And, um, and I know I'm making broad sweeping statements and it's not always the case, but um, I do think that anytime you have a different way of seeing the world, different life experiences that are coming into it, you're gonna end up having different stories to share. You're gonna filter everything through a different lens. I totally agree with that. I've, I've been told by editors that my work is very feminine. It's kind of like, well, is that because I photographed mom and baby animals? Like, <laughs> that would be easy to say. But I think, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, no, it goes beyond your subject matter. It's the intimacy that you capture in the quiet moments. and and that there's just this feminine quality to it. It's hard to see your own work and see and see if that's in your own work and to see your work from sort of another point of view. But um, I do think that artistically there's, there's something that women bring to the table. Susan, you were saying something the other day about women bringing something to the table for the industry as a whole. Well, totally. I mean, I think it's, I think we've, 
had very we've had binocular vision on things for for way too long and i think we really need to break that open um i think women have everything that both of you have said already um the difference in uh, the way that women will just even handle their equipment and in relationship to people the fact that, I mean, I'm going back to, to another question about personal safety. The fact that a woman is in a situation and is concerned about her own personal safety will affect her presence in that place and the way that she's perceiving other people or other things. I mean, these are just all fundamental differences of approach at a given time. Um, just like if somebody were to walk in there, you know, and, and, was only half dressed you'd, you'd have a very different way of taking in the situation uh than you would if you were um in a different situation you know different circumstances but um i think that women have everything with you're talking about susan um uh, susie uh, a greater sensitivity a greater um um I think women know how to breathe. I think they know how to get behind a camera and take their time. I think that they've had so many challenges to getting to where they are that they put more they put more thought into what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I remember you said to me, you might kill me for saying this in public, but I remember you said to me once that an assignment is 90% hard work, 10% talent, uh, and women yeah. tend to work harder than men. That's right. Yeah, there's no question. And yeah. that's, which is probably statistically out there. I mean, the women, to get where they are, they have to not only be as good as the men, but they have to be better. You know? yeah. And it is 90% hard work and 10% talent. You're all wonderfully talented, but you also work your asses off. So congratulations. Truly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. That just made me think of uh, that study that came out about... Um, confidence levels and when men will put themselves forward for jobs based on based on their experience versus the tendency for women and it was basically something like you know men might you know have only really like 50 percent uh the of the skill level needed mm -hmm. and they're like yes i can do this job and women it's like we're usually around we want to be like 90 percent or above in confidence of like that we've definitely got everything down and can do something before we put ourselves out there which makes me think that if any editor is like uh or other person who's hiring a, a photographer if they are having a conversation with a woman who is like bringing themselves to you it means like there's probably a pretty good chance that, that we've put ourselves through a, a yeah. pretty rigorous litmus test of readiness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Very good. Yeah. There's a um, conversation happening in the comments right now between a lot of women who are talking about just how um, the how much they feel like they lose because men have such camaraderie and they trade tips and tricks and whatever and resources and this and that and but they've really missed that in terms of their own um, professional development and i want to call out gail laird who is the academy's uh in-house photographer and she's one of the women um who's just so happy to hear you all talking about gail's uh, also awesome yeah totally <laughs> but i thought that is a really good segue into you know we had two last questions and as we come up on the 90 minute mark I thought I would actually combine them because the first was just, are things changing? But it's just like, you're all here talking about this stuff and you all have created your own resources or are supporting our resources, other resources. So like, yes, it is changing. And I would like to just dive into um, those resources and, and how they um, help the current photographers as well as next gen photographers. And Susie, maybe you can kick us off on this one. Right, okay, so I am really, I tend to be very hopeful um, about things changing. Um, I think that, oh my God, there's so many resources now. Like if, if, if half of these existed when I was getting into this career, I would have been so happy. Um, I think there's a huge sense of community and sisterhood in this, um, industry that is starting to form, which is really nice. I think that when I was getting into it, it was like women had to work so hard and we were so cute and we were like not working together. It was just like you did your own thing, right? And it, and there was no collaboration, there was no camaraderie. 
I was very much not even connected to my female peers because there weren't that many. And then also too, like I was just kind of burying my head in the sand and doing my own thing. And then, you know, I think when I, I hit my 40s, I decided to start Girls Who Click. And just I'll just say very briefly, Girls Who Click is a nonprofit that I started to try to encourage young women to enter this male dominated field. We run free workshops for teen girls and we also have an ambassador program for for emerging photographers to have a year long mentorship with people like Jamie, Mo and myself and Susan also, um, all of us are mentors. And so this idea of building other women up um, and also making this this career be feel like a safe choice for teens who are who really are it's a, it's shocking how many teens we talk to who are told that their idea of having either a career in nature photography or any career outdoors because we get girls that want to be biologists conservationists but they're still told by society and sometimes even direct family members that this is not a viable career or that it's too hard to make a living um, and so to, to essentially give them permission to choose a life outdoors because it's a life that gives me and I think in all of us great joy and a girl isn't as entitled to that as a boy and to give them permission to choose it I think is is really powerful um, and so we you know having these resources like girls who click and then also you know Jamie and Mo I know you guys are going to speak about her wild wow vision but that resource for editors to be able to more easily use women's pictures. Um, I know Jamie's going to talk about um, Wild Idea Lab and that community that can provide support, not just to women photographers, but young photographers in general, but I know you have a lot of female members. And so there are so many resources out there now to, to you know, build each other up, network, and um, help each other succeed, I think is really, and also going back to what Mo said, these are, you know, about the idea of like there's not one way to do things and it's not assignment photography for everybody there's multiple ways of making a career in this so being able to open each other's eyes to okay well if it doesn't work for you that way because we all face a massive amount of rejection like don't let that stop you because there's this way and so i think that there are an incredible amount of resources so i'd love um to hear i know about uh, her wild vision but i'd love to hear you guys talk about her wild vision and what that is doing You go for it, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for anyone who doesn't know, we do have some Her Wild Vision Initiative members in the chat, which is pretty rad. But for anyone who doesn't know, um, Her Wild Vision Initiative is a directory of women identifying photographers and filmmakers working specifically in conservation visual storytelling. And Morgan and I were, you know, this is totally one of those COVID projects where we finally had the time to, to sit around and, and think about the fact that it's really hard for um, women working specifically in conservation and environmental um, storytelling to be found and hired by editors, by producers, by um, media content developers and communication directors. So we created basically a searchable directory uh, where women can apply to become members and we list them in this directory. And then the directory allows uh, editors to search by different criteria. So location, your expertise and that sort of thing. Um, and we also wanted it to be more than just a listing. We wanted to be a way of removing barriers for editors, but also barriers for the photographers and filmmakers themselves. Some of those things that we face as women in this field. So I'm gonna actually, Mo, why don't you talk about what else Her Wild Vision Initiative does? Yeah, so um, I should uh, also point out, like Jamie and I don't choose who, who goes into the directory. So, and this is one of the things we really love about it is that like everyone who applies, this, we have this amazing panel of editors, Susan is one of them and everyone who applies um, their portfolio and application goes in front of um, a pretty high profile, like the best editors that are working in the business. So it's, we love that it's like an opportunity for, for all these um, women and new talent to get in front of the best editors in the business. And um, so there's, that's one of the thing, like whether you get in or not, you get in front of a major editor um, and then we have an array of like, we, we're developing some scholarship programs. So we have a couple scholarships already 
that um, one that's on Zoom presentations um, uh, given by Steve Mandel. And then we've got, uh, we're, we're working on a scholarship for a project scholarship that's like a no strings attached project scholarship. You could use it to pay for childcare. You could use it to buy gear. You could give it, give yourself a stipend, just like whatever you need to help with a project that you're working on. And, and then we also are working on forming a collaboration with a workshop that, that has to do with safety and conflict training, because as you may have guessed, like there's a lot that, that we have to think about when we're in the field and we don't ever want a woman to be intimidated out of pursuing her dreams. So we want you to feel like you've got tools that you can use that are going to make you feel safer and more able to navigate the landscape where these projects occur. Awesome. And then Jamie, do you want to talk about um, World ID Lab? That's a great resource. I would love to talk about Wild ID Lab. <laughs> um, what, so, and I noticed in the comments as well um, that there were a few comments saying like you can't really find uh, community or collaboration. Um, you want to be able to find your other colleagues and talk about what it is that you're doing and and get that community. And that's it doesn't really exist all that much in conservation photography. And I wanted to make sure that that resource is out there for people. And that's why I created Wild Idea Lab. And Wild Idea Lab is a membership community for conservation photographers and filmmakers. And it's a place to get educational resources. So we have master classes, we have mentor meetings. Um, Morgan and Susie are both mentors inside the lab. Um, and so we have all these educational and professional development opportunities, but then it's also a hangout hub. So it's conservation photographers of all and filmmakers of all skill levels um, who are in there talking about things and sharing what they're working on and um, troubleshooting with each other on projects or even specific shot ideas uh, and just kind of hanging out and having fun. We have happy hours and coffee hours and. Um, I, I started Wild Idea Lab because as so like we've all talked about when I was getting started 10 years ago, I didn't really see very many resources or, or trying to like find that community that wanted to talk not just about nature photography, but also about conservation, about what we do with our images and how do we tell stories better and be really effective. It was really hard to find that. And so Wild Idea Lab, I feel really lucky to be able to start to pull that into, you know, one hub and everyone has access to that. And we, we focus on um, a lot of, yeah, the technical stuff and all of that, but we also care a lot about diversity inside of this field and making sure that women feel like they have the resources that they need to get out there and also diversifying um, the culture, the ethnicity. We want to make sure that there's storytelling, there's room for storytelling inside this field for everybody. Um, and I think that while we're having an amazing conversation about women specifically, we also need to be having more conversations about diversity on a larger scale inside of this field. So anyway, I, I can talk add, forever about Wild Idea mm -hmm. Lab and her help. I just want to add to that comment about um, diversity and that is something that I think, you know, Girls Who Click, one of the things that we, when we launched our ambassador program, one of the specific reasons why we launched it is because we wanted to create a program where we could encourage diversity because this, this industry is so white male dominated. And so it's hard to find women that are working professionally in this career, let alone a diverse set of, of women. And so one of the things that we really did is to, for the ambassador program is we actually went out and targeted and found actively searched for women that were of diverse backgrounds to ask them to apply to the ambassador program and in hopes that as those women emerge as photographers and become professional, then this industry might have a little bit more color to it because um, that is, yeah, I know we've been talking about women's issues in general, but man, the, it is a, a big problem that it is so white as well. Um, and so we're really proud of the fact that our ambassador program is 50% diverse, which means a lot to us. Um, and those are, you know, women from all over the world of um, different backgrounds, which is great. But yeah, this, it's very strange how, you know, this is an incredibly joyful, beautiful career that is in so many ways very old fashioned. Um, which is a, a little bit strange considering, you know, all the gear we use is usually top of the technology, right? And, and, so, and we're so modern in some ways in this career, but in other ways, my God, we are very, very slow to change. 
Yeah. Well, Susie, on, on that note, I will say, I, you know, I, I, I have hope. I'm looking at these notes, these comments on the side, and the number of women, including my girls who click mentees on here, <laughs> yeah. the comments, which is totally, hey. <laughs> definitely got to get in there with you, Jamie and Morgan, with your projects and, and your um, workshops. She, she needs all of that. So uh, I'm very hopeful. And uh, if there's any one thing that was a problem with uh, the male dominated profession of photography is that it was uh, very insular and um, competitive and um, dog eat dog. And I would say that women networking the way that they are, it's just a complete inverse of that. You know, the networking, the sharing, the, the growth opportunities. I mean, I think it's, I think it's fabulous. And I think what's going to happen with photography is going to be fantastic. So thank you all. Yeah, I, this has been wonderful, Anna. You know, I, I think here, here, Susan. Yeah, and, um, you, wildlife photography is so it's so critical to the Academy's mission and to the stories our scientists are trying to tell that, you know, I would love for this to be the first in a series that we do on this and that we can talk about diversity even more broadly than we have today. So please come back, bring your organizations, bring your mentors, <laughs> bring your ambassadors, and let's talk about doing some more because this 90 minutes like flew by and it was wonderful. I can't thank you all enough. Thank you, Laurel. Thank, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you all. so much. And thank you all viewers for joining us and for uh, talking to us. And um, we will see you again soon. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.